My issue with architecture more would be the indoctrination that happens from being at university for such a long period of time. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today we've got a very special episode because it's actually taken from a interview with myself with the brilliant Jason Boyle. So Jason is a podcaster, he's a fellow of the RABA, he's an architect, he's specialized in nuclear power station architecture, working up in Sellafield. I've had him on the Business of Architecture UK podcast himself. Um, he's been a brilliant advocate for mentorship in the architectural industry. He has launched a successful podcast which this interview is taken from called the broke architect podcast if you're not already listening to that and subscribing to it go ahead um go right now and hit subscribe find that podcast it's absolutely brilliant but he's been a real advocate for the raising of of fees for better working conditions in the architecture industry. And I was very privileged for Jason to invite me onto the podcast so that we could have a discussion about many of those things. We talk about the differences between the US and the UK and their business practices and business cultures. We talk about the similarities. We discuss um, about why so many business practices are missing from architectural firms around the world. We talk about the current state of education and the damage that it's doing with its negligence and negation of anything business and that that just gets tacked on to the end and the kind of harmfulness that that creates as a culture that we all end up living into. And we talk about the lies. Okay? And we're very direct about this. We talk about the lies, the myths, the cult-like nature of the architectural profession that have been keeping the industry broke, that have been keeping the industry in a state of financial impotency, if you like. So I thoroughly enjoyed doing this interview with Jason. Um, once again, please go and subscribe to his podcast. And if you're not already subscribing to the Business of Architecture, make sure you do that as well. Um, but sit back, relax, and enjoy myself and Jason Boyle in conversation over at the Broke architect podcast this episode is sponsored by smart practice business of architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom fulfillment and financial profit if you want access for our free training on how to do this please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you please follow the link in the information how are you today I'm, I'm brilliant. Thank you very much. Very a right privilege to finally be on the on the show. Yeah. Been following what you've been doing over the last uh, is it a couple of years now or a year. It's just this year, yeah. Just this well, year, great. I think we should start like I start with everyone, really. Just if you could tell me a little bit about your background and really why you wanted to study architecture. So I. Started studying architecture as a result of probably poor, not poor career advice, just limited career advice that we all get when you're at school and you display some semi aptitude for maths, physics, and have a creative bent and do enjoy drawing and art and music and those kinds of things. And somebody says, you know, you should become an architect and it suddenly ticks all the boxes and you say it to your parents and everyone's excited and happy and sounds like, you know, Great, then we can go off and do it. I was, I was quite, probably quite young when I decided I wanted to be an architect, maybe 14. But I didn't know anything about architecture. I didn't know what architecture was about. I didn't particularly have any interest in buildings even. I enjoyed traveling. And when I was about 16, 16 I had the great privilege of living in Hong Kong for a couple of years. Um, and that really blew my mind because when I was brought up in South London, early Croydon, um, area and I hadn't really traveled at all until I got to Hong Kong. And so as a 16 year old, you arrive at Chet Blackcock. I think I thought Hong Kong was in Japan as well at the time. I arrived and my mouth was just dropped as I saw all the extraordinary skyscrapers of kind of Manhattan of, of Asia. Um, and was, was very quickly seduced by the excitement of, of big buildings and also the, the kind of interest of how communities grow, build, develop, and how people organize themselves. So 
that aspect of architecture, community building, travel was was very exciting. And then, you know, I did my I ended up doing a, an art foundation course uh, at Chelsea, uh, and then went into the Bartlett and began my kind of architectural training for better or for worse. You, you qualified as a as an architect. As I understand it, how long did you practice? Because you went to work for a really prestigious practice, Ryan, didn't you? Yeah. So I, um, my part one, I worked for Peter Barber Architects, and wow. th- I thoroughly enjoyed that. And this, so this is you know twenty years ago, pretty much. And Pete was doing some amazing stuff, and really was very touched by the way that he ran a practice and the way that he looked after people and the sort of social mission that he had, and kind of. You know, having and and also Pete runs a very kind of efficient business. Just their sort of building language, and you know you have to be with with, with those kinds of projects, is, and they need to be they need to, be, they need to get built. But that was very good. And then after my part two, which was also at the Bartlett, I graduated and started working at Grimshaw. Worked there for a few years, uh, and then I worked for RSHP Rogers Practice, and that was that was amazing. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. But this was the time of kind of just post 2008 where we were dealing with recession and, you know, it took, it did take a good sort of four or five years after 2008 for things to become normal. I remember working when I was doing my part two, I used to work in the summers. I remember just, you know, contacting a, a recruitment agent or something like that and sending half a CV and then having sort of three options of where I could go to work. And like, all right, fine, I'll pick that one. And, and it was easy. And then when I graduated, it was, it was barren. There was, there was absolutely nothing. And I mean, I was very lucky to get a job at Grimshaw. And again, the, the, the kind of finding jobs, you know, I'm very, I mean, I sent loads of CVs off to companies and did all that kind of stuff. But every time I actually ever got a job or even got an interview, it's always been through a network. That's a really important point, isn't it, really, to um, say networking. Networking is really, is, is really key because um, the chances of getting a job um, just by sending your CV and portfolio is, um, I always it's just, find it. It's just hit and miss. It's just hit and miss. I mean, I, I, I always, when I talk to students, I always say, you know, start your networking, build your personal brand online, start talking about your work, connect with, um, with industry professionals. I mean, generally, if a student approaches me in the right manner on LinkedIn or whatever, I'm, I'll always jump on a sort of 15-minute call with them and have a chat and, and, whatever, and, and whatever. And that's a very good way to start building a network and just introducing yourself and developing relationships you don't need to you know if you if you kind of focus on making five friends in the industry follow their work take an interest in what they're doing professionally and certainly if you if, if their work has a bit of relevance to what perhaps you're interested in the university it's a great way to just to start cultivating a a relationship um you know be be thoughtful of who it is that you're you're approaching and that can open a lot of doors I've just got one question that springs to mind. I don't know if you've got children, but if you had the child, would you encourage them to do architecture? And be interested to know your answer. I would. However, I would ensure that whatever they did, that they, they're going to go through my school of entrepreneurship and business. So I'm not particularly worried about what, if I had a child, what they would, what they would do because I would be wanting them to be very fluent in the world of business before they even do their A-levels. And I mean, that means like if I had a, a kid, I would be getting them into the workplace early. We'd be playing with ideas, you know, lemonade stands. I would, I'd be very much encouraging of all that kind of stuff. They want to, if, if they wanted to be a musician, that would probably be my soft spot where I would be like, okay, you know, but again, you want to be a musician then you go, you're running a business. Don't get sucked into the the lie of, you know, you're going to get picked up by a a record company and they're going to look after you. It's the same thing with architecture. Don't don't get sucked into you're going to be looked after by anybody. Understand business, understand how it works. It's a very useful um, skill base for your, even if you just want to stay as an employee, because if you start understanding the business aspects of it and how to win work, you're career and your salary can increase enormously 
if you and and if you want to go and be more creative and have more freedom, great. Then you can set up your own your own organization. My issue with architecture more would be the indoctrination that happens from being at university for such a long period of time. That would be more my concern because I feel that the the university culture that we have at the moment um, negates the economic and financial forces that shape a building. They're completely ignored, and this has massive detrimental impact for the industry as a whole and where people put their focus when they go into when they go into business. And it's just massively irresponsible, and it's caused you know it's been going on for a long time now and. It's, you know, we've got all these problems, you know, the name of this, this podcast is a result of us completely ignoring the, the kind of financial forces that help create a building. And it's just negligence, really. It's just, it is. There's no, there's no there's, it is. it's just really, really poor. I mean, if people are investing, um, you know, large amounts of money for their, for their education and then they're coming out and, Number one, you know, you're going to get paid very lowly as a part one, you know, and there's loads of reasons for this. Well, I mean, from a business operator's perspective, you know, I will, I will actively encourage small practices, do not hire part ones. You are generally not in the position to hire a part one unless you can train them because they don't have the skills coming out of university to be able to do what you want. So there's two things happening here. One is the part ones don't really have any skills which are appropriate for practice they've got loads of skills which are great and they've got great ways of thinking and in reality nowadays as well you'll probably be better enumerated with those thoughtful design skills in a different profession quite honestly but in the profession of architecture you don't learn much construction technology you don't learn anything about money finance working with a client working with a team um you know any part of the business context of it um and you're very idealistic in in the in the approach. That's that's good. That has its certainly has its benefits. But as a young part one coming out into a practice, the practice needs to invest in you before that you can start making the business money. And again, we're we're a business. We're talking about money. When you uh, when a when a when a business owner employs um somebody that person is going to be contributing their efforts and helping the business make money and that money gets shared amongst the the team and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so when you're coming out as a part one you don't have the the kind of the right skills therefore the practice needs to train you um and then that that's reflected in the salary unfortunately and the, the other part of this is that we see business owners who are being either cheap or they haven't really defined or understand what their business needs, and then they think a part one can do it. And, you know, if we just get a good, a really good solid part one, that will fix it. All right, good luck with that. It's just going to be frustrating for both parties. It is very frustrating for both parties. And I've heard lots of horror stories on the podcast where part ones have been, you know, designing um, details for swimming pools, that, uh, you know, within a day, um, so much pressure on running big projects because um, part one coming out of university has not got them skills yet and, and they should not expect that. Yet yeah, they are part ones put into them positions. Some of them I've recently heard have been fired, you know, because mm-hmm. they're not performing. Well, what's your, what's your expectations? So it's a, it's a very good point. Don't employ a part one unless you've got that time to nurture that individual. Yeah, or, or, you're, or you're very clear on the things that they can do. I mean, if I look at what I did at Pete Barber's, for example, in my part one, that was a very good sort of fit in terms of, you know, they had a, he did loads of hand drawing in the office and sat me down and I did loads of hand drawing and did pretty pictures of lots of schemes and it worked out worked out well. I mean, I do know part ones who have, who have kind of remained part ones for like the best part of 10 years. And this is another, another thing because they actually then do develop really great skills and are being trained in the office, then have kind of ridiculous, you know, gaps or kind of caps, if you like, on their earning potential because they haven't got this silly word architect. Yeah. And it's like, well, okay, what's going on? What's going on here? I just want to ask as well, because then we'll get into what you do yourself, but do you miss designing buildings? No. And what, what's the reason why you don't? I am, um, so personally, 
I've always found design uh, in practice a bit boring, and I'm not one for sitting behind a computer on CAD. Um, maybe bits of conceptual work is still interesting, but I, I probably my my nature. I like to do lots of things all at once, and talking and being with people was very important. I find my current career path is incredibly creative in terms of I'm helping loads of businesses design their businesses yeah. and I get to sit down and we get to design strategy and think and then I have the delight of being able to be involved indirectly with all of their building work and all of their projects um, and I know that I've kind of contributed to them being able to, to, to fulfill on their kind of design ideals as a result of having a healthy business behind them. And then, you know, it's well remunerated by what I do and I'm able to kind of work with designers on my own house, if you like, or do, do other things and that satisfies my uh, creative itch. I mean, I've been doing a, we've been renovating our apartment in the States over the last few, uh, over the last year. And I must yeah. admit, I, I, I haven't done barely any design on that. It's been my, my partner who's been, the one who's kind of doing it. I might do some sketches every so often, but I don't miss design particularly. And it's interesting, when I was at university, I did everything I could to not... I was one of these weird students who kind of did everything they could not to design a building. So a lot of the projects that I did, certainly my diploma project, was so far away from architectural building. You know, it was kind of a bit, you know, pointless in a, in a way. But also, when I look at it now, you know, I was interested in communication and how people develop rapport and was trying to express that as a, in architectural language. And if I'd had, if there'd been a business part of the school, they would have said, you know what, this is very akin to marketing and advertising and sales. Perhaps you should go and do like a, like a sales module or an advertising module or something like that and it would have been a better fit, but. I enjoyed it and I enjoyed my time at the Bartlett. Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun and, and uh, I don't miss build, designing buildings just yet. Great. And no bullying went on, of course. No. I mean, I, I'm at, at the Bartlett. I mean, the bar, the, just to talk about that a little bit, because I, uh, I did both my degree and diploma there at the time where there was where a lot of this kind of controversy has happened. And certainly, certainly I was aware um, that there were units that were not, that were, that had a, a heavier hand, if you like. And I would certainly say that a lot of us who certainly who did the degree and then went back for diploma knew how to navigate it and which units to avoid and, and did so. Yeah, well, yeah, we won't we won't uh, labour on that one, but it's interesting that you were around at that at that sort of time. Um, yeah, really interesting. I really interested. It's a big it's a big question to ask here, but I'm uh, this. I'm sure you you'll provide me with a good answer to this. You know, what are the common mistakes that most architects keep making? You know, relating to practicing architecture. Good question. So, from my perspective the kind of fundamental mistake that the industry is making as a whole and that each individual practice makes as a whole is there is little priority put onto money. Money and making making money and making profit, looking after profit, creating profit in the front end of the sale, then tracking and recording profit as you go through your, your project and your hours protecting it with systems and automation and processes and checklists uh, and then reinvesting it and growing it and sharing it. Okay, so that's the kind of life cycle of profit that just doesn't exist in most practices. And from my perspective, the majority of problems that we see in the architectural industry, overwhelm, stress, unpaid internships, um, exploitation, low fees, it's because no one's paying any attention to money. And even to, even when I talk about money, I get looked at like I'm some sort of mad, greedy capitalist that's trying to turn the architecture industry into some sort of demented, you know, finance course. And it's just nonsense. And it's very, frustra it's very frustrating. I think people can intellectually kind of understand 
where I'm coming from when we talk about the priority of focusing on money. But it, there's also like an emotional relationship that we have to money. And again, starting at university, the whole conversation is negated and we don't talk about it. And when we come into the, the, the workplace, again, most businesses are not really focusing on profit margins or, or, or money. And we never establish a healthy relationship to see how healthy profits actually impact and facilitate agency and great design. There's a very positive relationship. And I was at a talk recently um, and was a little bit perturbed by the general culture of the, a lot of architects where there was just a general suspicion around focusing on profit and growth. We are not running behemoth corporations or Fortune 500 companies in architecture. We're not talking about kind of unregulated profit making at all expense to satisfy you know, shareholders who have no direct input into, into a business and kind of doing unsustainable practices. We're small businesses. Even the largest architectural practice is a small business. In the world of kind of business, you know, anything under $30 million pounds in revenue is considered a small business. All architecture firms are small business. Focus on flipping profit. It's, it's like we need to grow up. Industry yeah. needs to grow up and, and set proper, healthy benchmarking targets, profit margins that are fiercely protected for everybody. This is why we don't have diversity in the profession. This is why um, women leave. This is why we don't have many black and uh, brown people um, moving up the ranks because if you're coming from a, a socioeconomic um, background, um, which is different from someone who's very, very wealthy and has the kind of um, resources behind them, and you invest eight years to ten years of your life to come out and get paid, you know, less than a McDonald's manager, why the hell would you become an architect? It's utterly, utterly stupid. And the fact that we do not put money and, and profit and the economics of the profession as a priority is impacting all of these things that we wave the banner for that we're saying are so important oh absolutely and you you look at the awards so people you know obviously attend sterling prizes and, and mm. regional awards and it there's never any discussion or any criteria on did was that how was that building procured did it make money um you know were people working crazy overtime to get that? Actual oh, abs absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It, 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 You're bang on here. I mean, there, there is no, the, the, the way that we rate and revere design is very kind of myopic. Yeah. And, you know, I often have people, you know, with, with my non architect friends, they'll often say to me, and this is before I got really interested in business. And, and, you know, kind of a little bit into my early career, people would say to me, oh, what do you think of this building? And I'd always be like, I don't know. I don't want to make a judgment on the building yet because I don't know the story of how it was made and what were the problems that the architects were solving. I can give like an aesthetic judgment of it. But I know that even some of the ugly buildings that sit down that you, that you come across, there's something there that's interesting where problems have been solved. And you don't necessarily know that at first sight. And I, and, I, and I think the way that the profession often evaluates design can be, it negates a lot of the, 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 the kind of backstory or the financial story or what's been happening with clients or how financial problems have been solved or, you know, you're working with really tight budgets here um, or, you know, was it a profitable project? And that's never spoken about for the business, was it? Did the, did the, and, that, and it would almost seem kind of gross to even be suggesting that but yeah no but i i think that's a really important thing that we we really need to bring into the mix because the one that won this year we don't know whether they made any profit they might have been working at a loss and supporting it with other projects mm -hmm. we just don't know and i think i think if we were grown up people grown up industry we, we could have them discussions about um you know, was it profitable? And, and that should be in the mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's, okay. it, it, it's very interesting. I was remember um, at, at Rogers, and Rogers used to get uh, criticized quite a lot for doing number one Hyde Park. And 
it's a it's a it's a you know whatever you might think of it it's 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 a classic rogers building with all of their kind of principles put in put inside of it and it is catering to the elite wealthy of the world and obviously that's where the controversy comes and certainly richard's political um kind of left leaning more socialist values, if you like, were well, he was very vocal about that and, and, a, and a kind of member of the late, uh, Labour Party. And w- when they engaged in that project, they were, you know, the practice was often faced a lot of criticism and, and certainly internally as well, that would have had some kind of tension that would have arisen from it. But the reality of it was, was that project, you know, it kept the business going during very difficult times. It, it facilitated the business to be able to engage in other research projects that perhaps weren't making money at the at the front end, such as a lot of their modular housing research that was going to be looked was that was being uh, applied to affordable housing. Number one, Hyde Park itself, as a result of the 106 that was done with the Candy Brothers, you know, facilitated a whole load of affordable housing that was built not on site but somewhere else. And I, I think, you know, personally, I think that's you know, it's a relatively reasonable thing. But those but those that wider context is never spoken about, and it's easy to kind of attack somebody and call them hypocritical, and it's and it's not true. And so the the, the financial context of buildings is is important and needs to be spoken about and architects you know I, I, I think it's we need to have a more powerful seat at the table with our clients when we're more financially fluent and yes. we're kind of more transparent with talking about the economics behind a building and actually demonstrating that we're not just people who are here to make things look good but actually can provide very good strategic thought on and protecting the business agendas of the of uh, of our clients, and also upholding our own values as architects, and making sure that this is done responsibly. Isn't it obvious architects are bad at business when we get no training in business? Shouldn't we spend a year at part two, or maybe you even think part one, and um, kind of really focusing on the business side of architecture? I would like to see the business. I wouldn't want to see like a business course at university because I think it would be done very badly. It would probably be run by academics and it would be another course that's like on the side that gets in the way with design. I'd rather see business principles and economic principles being integrated into design projects and encouraged. And so that people are starting to, and I've, I mean, I've, and yeah, you know, the stuff that, um, Rob's been doing up at Manchester. I'm, you know, big fan of that. Some of the things the LSA are doing, they're just kind of bringing in a, a more of a sense of reality to design work. I've interviewed people in the past who have run units in the US on design courses where they've actually had students design the, the business model for the practice that would be delivering their project. And then how that practice was negotiating with the developer clients that they were using. To, and that kind of speculation is really, really good. And we can take the kind of same creativity that we have where we're testing all of our kind of architectural ideas in the safety of being at university. And we should be doing it with business. Because business is creative. It's not a boring, static um, accounting thing. It is like the generator of freedom. If you want to play the game... Uh, it's the it's the it's the thing that can unlock, you know, value communication. You know, ensure that we're getting well remunerated. So, using the university environment as a safe place to test, you know, financial ideas, brilliant because you're not actually dealing with any real money here. But we want to ha- we want to stop divorcing business and finance from architectural production because the negation of it at university is unintentionally creating this avoidance culture where business is a bad thing, where profit is a bad thing, where making money is somehow evil and greedy and horrible and that we mustn't be aspiring to, to grow in our, in our organizations. That mindset is very troubling. And if, we don't, if we're not interested in growth, if we're not interested in money, then we have the current situation. It's almost like we've been conditioned. Yeah. You know? Yeah, indoctrinated at university. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, again, I do, you know, I, I do think that the the architectural education is very powerful, 
and looking at the world through an architectural lens is incredibly rewarding and and interesting and we're starting to see you know the kind of the benefits of of that training being well remunerated outside of the profession now i don't know what to, to do about that particularly i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing and would like to see universities being more proactive in establishing relationships with with tech um and you know kind of helping structure pathways and for having startups or incubators kind of like what MIT does and some of the american universities where you know, they, the universities become breeding grounds for new business ideas and you can have other industries coming in but then maybe we should stop calling it architecture and we should call it architectural thinking or design thinking Ooh. um and have it as a, a different course and if you want to become a practicing architect then either you don't need to go to university you can be educated purely in practice or there's i don't know you could you, i wouldn't be against the idea of having 15 different ways of becoming an architect and all of them being a lot more you know entrenched in reality of working in a practice and actually learning the craft in practice and and why why do we why do we prize design as being the first thing we learn as opposed to the rules of like how a architecture is working in practice and then design becomes the thing that we then spend the rest of our lives developing that seemed to work fairly well for Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier and all these others didn't it <laughs> yeah I'm glad right yeah you spend a lot of time in the US and you have an American business partner yeah, what are the big differences between the UK and the USA in terms of how architects operate successfully? Yes, that's really interesting. So the majority of what I do these days is US based. So I run I run the US uh, the UK um, BOA podcast. I also um, do a lot with the the American or the the, the global podcast. And the majority of my clients, so Business of Architecture, Enoch and I run Business of Architecture has, has grown into a consulting agency where we've got about 60, 65 clients all over the world. Probably 75% of them are, uh, are in the US. And my, my role is predominantly I'm the sort of the, the, the partner involved in business transformation and consulting and working one-to-one -one with architects every single day. So I spend a good eight hours a day talking with architects very intimately about their, about their businesses. And yeah, 75% in the US, probably about 20% here in the UK and the rest are elsewhere. And there are some very key cultural differences. One is that in general, I mean, in the architecture world, where you are, wherever you are, business and money and profit is still a bit of a dirty word. But the Americans certainly do have uh, a little bit more openness when talking about business and money and aspiration. And often I'll talk with um, you know, business owners and they'll be very proud, they'll very proudly tell me, I'm from a family of entrepreneurs. I'm from a family, my father owned this type of shop, my mother did this type of thing, da 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 da. And they're also a little bit more open to kind of business uh, investment and business education and business knowledge. But they're more enterprising in many ways and more kind of transparent and, and open about it. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of the, the concept of freedom that's built into, the, into their constitution and, and the kind of uh, culture of entrepreneurship and and um you know searching searching and creating and bettering yourself so there's definitely that and that is reflected in the business um in the uk i i find the industry is in general is a little bit more polarized so there's a lot of really small practices and then there's the behemoths the big sort of international global practices and you know there's not much there's not that much mid ground, if you like. And I guess in the US, it's a lot more diverse. You've got more different cities and different parts of the parts of the country. And there is a lot more concentration of wealth in the US as well. So I mean, it's very unlike it's very rare in the UK that you'll hear about new build houses being constructed for like 100 million pounds or something like that, where 
in the US that happens quite a bit. So there's there's definite there's definite differences, but there's there's also a kind of cultural difference and us Brits where masters of self-deprecation and sarcasm and suspicion and cynicism to our own detriment in many ways. And one thing I really and and why I've deliberately kind of focused a lot of my attention on the US is that in if 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 you come up with an idea in America and you say, I want to do this, this and this, there's usually an attitude of like, yeah, you can do it. Whereas here there is more of an attitude of why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> I mean I was I was at the AIA um uh annual gala in New York the other day. I was very moved by the the sort of rallying cry of everybody of just you know people were standing up and saying new york is the most creative center in the entire planet and this city is the best and there's a kind of like a real kind of togetherness and i i found that actually quite impressive for a city of 13 million people and i was like i've never heard people talk like that in 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 london but on the other side of it the the americans work very very hard and probably don't take as much time off as they should. And that's certainly something that I encourage a lot of my, my clients to do and to, and to kind of prioritize rejuvenation. And I think us in, in, in Europe, we're a little bit more, you know, prioritize our, our leisure. And, and I think there is definitely, I don't know, the, the, there's, there's certainly a lot more history and, past to contemplate, if you like, uh, which adds to a culture of us slowing down a little bit. Um, Americans aren't taking as much leave and holidays. They don't get to travel as often um, and see the rest of the world. Um, yeah, but it's, but it's also very difficult in the US to, when you, when you go to the US, you realize how enormous the country is. Like California is bigger than the UK, you know, pretty much from north to from the top end to the, to the bottom end. Texas will just gobble up England. You know, these, these states are enormous and either side of the country are these enormous oceans. So just getting out of the U.S. is no easy, it's not easy, you know, it's, yeah. and, it's, and it's expensive to, to kind of leave. And then the country itself has so much diversity inside of it. Each state is really fascinating and has its own rules and its own regulations. And, you know, you can imagine maybe... Uh, maybe maybe 40 years ago or so that each state was kind of competing with each other to attract entrepreneurs and businesses and lowering tax rates and so there's a very interesting kind of you know kind of flavor if you like um structurally in the in the US which has kind of created this market of of healthy competition which we don't have that at all here in in the UK and London's a little bit of its its own island to the rest of the rest of the UK and a little bit of an out and like a you know the, London doesn't represent the UK. You know, yeah. there's there's a, there's a load of other stuff that's interesting and happening in 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 England and people tend to be very myopic on on the UK and the US is a bit more kind of better spread. The other thing I would say is that in the US there's certainly um very polarized and perhaps that's a kind of media ag agitation as well. So it appears very polarized and they're kind of they can often be quite opposing opinions i mean i guess it's like that here as well these days but it's very it's it's interesting i'm i'm, I'm in the process of uh i want to write a book about the u.s and architecture practice in the u.s from the eyes of a brit and one of my goals is to visit every single state and interview and liaise with an architect in every single one of the u.s states and then compile it into a little book that would be fascinating really would really would I mean, maybe this can this this next question is, you know, what are the good and bad things about British and American architects, and what can we learn uh, from each other? That's a good, very good question. I think the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has this wonderful heritage of the of like the big corporate practice and the the heritage of you know the kind of Californian case study houses and. You look at Foster's and Rogers, they were massively influenced about what was happening in, in America and modernism on the West Coast and the kind of implementation of, you know, new manufacturing and industrial techniques and how that could be applied to 
to actually the fabrication of business and the business um, and architecture and architectural language. And you look at the, the high tech movement here in the UK, and it's got its its DNA in the US. I mean, Fosters and Rogers, you know, studied at where was it at, at Yale or I don't remember which university it was. Well, Yale, yeah. You know, they 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 studied there and kind of were, were deeply influenced by it and spent a long time traveling around and looking at the work of Mies van der Rohe and um, the Eames and all these people um, and kind of, you know, really riffed on a lot of that modernist philosophy that was that was taken. And a lot of it was about a kind of efficiency, systemization, automation, processes, um, and developing an architectural language that was, you know, that was utilizing the new fabrication techniques of industry that were happening and that kind of opened up a whole new world and that that kind of architectural language lent itself very well to business um both you know reflexively so applying that architectural language to yourself and having your own business automated and systems and lightweight and efficient and you know actually having a kind of you know, thinking of buildings like components and sets of components there's an, an, there's a kind of efficiency that comes with that um and and also like you know where's the expression where's there's where's the delight in that as well which those kind of high-tech practices became very good at, at at playing with and and then we see the rise of some of these the great behemoths in the u.s the you know your genslers and your som and home pedersen fox and these you know big practices are are good examples of very well-run corporate businesses that you know put aside what you might think about their work okay because we need to kind of just divorce that there is really really powerful lessons to be learned from how those businesses operate and how they're very financially astute um and how they're very kind of refined in their in their programs and their processes and how they maintain a profit and how they deliver um, you know good good service i was chatting to the the cfo of mancini duffy recently and the and the president there there's practice in new york and cfo um bola she had spent many years kind of cutting her teeth at i think it was som she was telling me about you know the, the things that she's been implementing at mancini duffy she's like li lifted from som and was very grateful for the experience of actually being trained there it was things that she you know perhaps didn't didn't enjoy every aspect of it, but the, the the kind of rigor that they had around financial intelligence and being very you know very observant to profit and having accountability for profit and having project managers be you know having every week they'd have to report back you know they'd they'd have like a, an hour allowance of how much they were doing. Now this might sound kind of horrific for for some you know for some practices, and I can see people. Is going no that's 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 terrible but it doesn't need to be as like so kind of it doesn't need to suck out all of the creativity but it needs to be there it needs to be there like it's like you know creativity flourishes really well on top of good structure and good routines and good discipline and so just having these pieces in place and again recognizing the relationship between that kind of financial rigor and discipline it, it starts to it starts to give well needed constraints to creativity. Creativity likes constraints. It doesn't like just being totally free and open. It needs constraints. We always hear architects talking about, you know, well, architecture needs constraints. That's how we get good design. Well, then bring it into your creative process as well, and use finance as a creative driver, not as something that's going to. Um, inhibit your your design processes and everyone will appreciate it and it will raise the the level of the of the profession financially enormously and also give us the confidence to be able to have financial conversations with our clients i mean i i you know just on, on a bit of a side here the negation of of business and talking about money in architecture school and then that kind of filters through due to all practices that you know we're in many cases we're we're kind of in charge of a client's budget we haven't got a flipping clue 
We don't understand how, we've got no idea how the, the client came up with the money, what their financing process has been like, what their financial cycles are like. We've got no idea about how to look after cash. You've got architects who are just like, you know, we're just going to go blue sky thinking and then we'll reverse engineer it to make it fit to a budget. Oh, well, then look what happens when you've got enormous amounts of scope creep and people are getting pissed off and upset and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't work. And it all comes from a kind of lack of confidence around talking about money. And, you know, the architecture, when we look at the incredibly well curated and compiled statistics and numbers from architecture from the RBA, the kind of benchmarking numbers, it is just reflecting on us our own financial impotency. Absolutely spot on. And this this leads nicely into the next question. You know, is there something wrong with architects who just want to make money? So for example, churning out McDonald's and big sheds is not sexy, but you can make good money and these buildings are still needed, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I don't have a problem with, you know, people, I mean, actually I've got, uh, I've got a couple of clients who do some fantastic sheds. And again, Rogers and Foster's started off doing big sheds. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of space there, um, to, to kind of have a, have a business that operates. I mean, we've had clients in the past who have had a, you know, a business model, which is less sexy and less, you know, architecturally interesting, but is providing, you know, well-needed, important infrastructure for other businesses and has done as, you know, it's done responsibly um, and it aligns with their values of what they're doing and they make good profit off it. And then they use that to, they use a kind of the, the, the very profitable aspect of their business to support more research or re- more research and development. And when they're able to do that, then they can, they can start to, you know, make more money out of the more glamorous projects that they want to do. Often the glamorous projects aren't what they thought they were going to be either. Um, you know, I, I interviewed um, Tom Kundig, Molson Kundig. I've, I've spoke with him a couple of times. And he always talks about when he first joined Jim Molson, that you know, there was a practice of seven people. They'd kind of shrunk down. They were on this precipice of financial collapse. Um, and the business was in a really bad way. And for the next sort of seven years, all they focused on was building their financial foundations and building up their kind of design philosophy. And those two were like, that's it. That's all we're going to do. Make sure we've got money in the bank so that when the right opportunity comes, we're ready. We're ready financially to be able to take a risk with the design. And we're ready philosophically because we've been testing design ideas and we've been talking about where we want to put our design, but the two are intimately related. You know, that might have meant doing projects that you don't see on a portfolio. It might mean, you know, doing other things. But it's, you know, it's massively, massively important that, the, again, that the financial responsibility is, is there in a, in a business. And I think if, you know, if you find yourself and, I mean, you'd be surprised as well of, of learning to negotiate and learning how to sell and to market, that actually there's a lot of very fulfilling design projects that can be very well paid. You know, we've, we've got a number of clients who do fantastic, you know, I would say most of our clients do brilliant design work and make a lot of money from doing it. And, and certainly when we start moving into self-initiated projects, so if you've got a business that's been running very well and you've been putting aside a certain amount of profit every single year into a bit of an investment fund, then great. Why not get yourself into a position where you can wear the hat of developer? And again, if you start learning the language of business and being confident in raising finance, um, you can partner up and then you can have total, total creative control on a project. You know, I've got clients in the, in the US who are, you know, kind of forwarding uh, affordable housing agendas um, I interviewed Space and Matter in Holland uh, a little while ago. What they're doing is extraordinary in terms of you know self-initiated projects. They're raising the capital and the finance. They're building kind of sustainable um, communities with a kind of circular economy or that's that's working. Flipping great. That's what's possible when you're being sensible with your business. You know, and if and if, and if um, you love designing sheds and it's making you good money and great. I, I, you know, I, was, I was accused the other day on Instagram 
when I, I posted something about, you know, here are some six ways to make more profit in your business. And somebody wrote to me and accused me of advocating that architects should be involved. You know, if you're just focusing on profit, then it means that architects are just going to be designing things like um, maybe Stockholm and terrible poor housing and, and all this kind of nonsense. And I was like, what a fucking stupid thing to say. Because the reality of it is, is that, well, those projects are not using architects for the, for, for the most part. And that's a, that's a problem. And when we see, it's the architects who are crap at business that end up doing shit work. Because yeah. they've got to take their, because they're getting squeezed on fees. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't know how to focus on the profit. I'm going to say something here to um, give you a little bit of a breather. But when I, when I started practice, uh, my first practice was working for ACP. Architects Cooperative Partnership, and this was right. an old practice um, set up by ex-students of the AA. And I remember them telling me this uh, third rule, uh, 30, 33% goes out in salary, 33% overheads, and 33% profit. And um, so, you, you know, if you're in an architecture, you're in that office, you've got to make three times his or her salary and fees for this to happen. I don't hear this. I never heard that ever you know, from that practice going forward in my career, it was never even discussed. Do you think we've lost sight of this? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, this is one of these old rules of thumb that, I mean, I expand this all the time with our, with our clients and we'll often talk about the rule of thirds. Um, and that 30% profit is, that's what we should be aiming for and we make everything else fit with the overheads third and the salary a third. I mean, I, I recounted a story the other day at, um, the talk I was giving at the RBA of how a young architect found my phone number. I don't know how they got my details online. Obviously, it's floating around there. But they've been listening to the. They've been listening. <laughs> they've been listening to the podcast, and he rang me up um, and was like, "I need to talk to you about about the business side of it. The business I'm working for is is terrible. My." Boss is exploiting us, and it's really, it's really, really awful. And I was like, "Wait, hold on a minute. What are you, what are you talking about? And how did you get my phone number?" Um, and he said, he said, "I just found out how much my boss is 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 charging me out at, and it's disgusting." I was like, "Right." He says, "My boss is billing me out at three times what I'm getting paid." And I was like, "Of course, of course, he is. Good for him. It's working. That's exactly what you should be doing now." That's, that, that little kind of anecdote illustrates a lot of things. It illustrates a lack of transparency in that particular business and that that business was not explaining and keeping the finances so close to their, you know, so close to their, their cards to the chest that, that the rest of the team didn't understand the context with which they are operating. And that's very infuriating for a young architect. If, you're, if these secrets are being kept, that doesn't work for me. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, big, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, you know, start getting transparent with, numbers you don't have to tell people how much everyone else is getting paid but you can certainly start having mature conversations about how your hours and why we do timesheets and the relationship to why we want to keep 30 percent profit because we want you guys to have a good life and we want to be able to pay people at a good rate and here's a career track and you know the partners end up making a lot of money because they're taking more risk and they bought into the business and they bring in work and if you develop sales skills and marketing skills that help us bring in work guess what you can start earning a lot more cash than just you know you know there's there's other there's other ways of value creation here in the in a in a business and there's different career career paths and so you can start having that conversation the other aspect of it was clearly at university and, and, and school, there was no discussion about the rule of thirds or the fact that, you know, the architects working, that's the only point where the business is, is making money is for the hours that the architects are, are, are working. But you've got to pay for, you know, you've got to pay for your office manager. You've got to pay for the PAs. You've got to pay for the HR department. You've got to pay for the marketing department. You've got to pay for all these other overheads you've got to pay for the rent and the software etc cetera, etc cetera. things like that i mean people should not be shouldn't be getting shocked at it and i have heard lots of stories of this where younger architects have been exposed to the finances of a practice and then they've been very shocked at it and have misinterpreted it right and again there's there's two people responsible here one is the sort of 
education that the younger architects have gone through previously. There's the architect themselves not being responsible with the information that they've just been shared. And then the leadership of that organization not having been transparent and kind of, you know, created an environment where this person now has, you know, checking it, this person is going to be responsible with the information that they're going to be shown. And I know that's, that's quite a lot of stuff there, but, you know, yeah. it's, it's massively important to start having this kind of financial conversation. And again, you get people interested in it at university and it's not siloed as here's the business course that you've got to attend that's going to get, get in the way of your design practice for an hour each week. And then people just do it on the side and it's really boring spreadsheets and stuff like that. That's not going to, that's not going to cut it. It needs to be integrated into, into design or we have the training of the architect happening more in the office. The reason why I asked that question, really, because I did put a poll out um, before this podcast and asked what um, a healthy profit margin was for an architect's practice, and the majority voted at 20%. I mean, if, if businesses were actually making more than 20%, then I'd like to, like to see that. I mean, when I look at, you know, majority of, of practices, it's, you know, more like 10% profit, sometimes, yeah. sometimes five and then it's ten percent of what is the other thing? It's kind of like you know, it's ten percent of a very low of a low turnover in the first place, and everybody else is getting very low um, low salaries and low fees. And it's kind of like that also can be quite distorted. And we have a benchmarking figure at Business of Architecture called the Two Hundred Club, and the Two Hundred Club is a high performance metric for a business that's doing very very well. And it's expressed in dollars, and it's two hundred thousand dollars per full-time equivalent employee. So, for every full-time equivalent employee that you have in your business, the business should be turning over two hundred thousand dollars. And when we see businesses who are kind of hitting that benchmark, that's often a very good. It doesn't tell everything about the business, okay? And there's often little bits of nuances that we need to un unpick. But it gives it's that for us is a a high-performing business. And that's been uh, a number that we've come up with through looking at hundreds of architecture practices and also looking at other industries that are, that are delivering complex services. Because, again, when we look at the ROBA or the AIA benchmarking surveys that, again, very well compiled, they are reflecting, in my opinion, an underperforming industry economically. So why would you compare yourself to somebody else who's doing badly? I mean, we need to be looking else, else, elsewhere. So, so 200,000, which is about 160,000 pounds, it's aggressive. Okay. But there's no shortage of businesses that are doing that, doing great design work, having an impact, doing, you know, leading with, with purposeful, um, profit and reinvesting back into their team members and paying team members well. And we've got clients who are well in excess of that as well. We've got, you know, there's, there's a handful of, People who are, who pretty much double that. So, and I know, you know, when I when I when I talk about that number, often people are like, "What? What are you talking about?" And then when you start seeing businesses that are doing it, then it's like, "Wow, okay, well, why aren't we talking about this more?" You know, I want to I, I want to make it like normal for architecture practices to be striving to be in that two hundred club, for them to be normalizing thirty percent profit. You know, that should be a standard. That's what we're, that's what we're operating at. Yeah. And that, and the architects, you know, in, in a relatively short period of time are able to have a six figure salary. Absolutely. Well, this, this leads me fantastically onto my next question. The salaries in the industry have stagnated. And I think we know many of the reasons why we've talked about it. But 20 years ago, I remember I saw a job for 40 K in Manchester for a, an architect. 10 years experience and today I'm still seeing 10 year experience architect 40k so what the f is going on here it's just it's disgraceful it's absolutely shocking what has happened absolutely shocking and again this is going to be as a result of this complete financial negligence and inability to negotiate and prioritize profit margins and fees and communicate value and being able to have a kind of strategic seat at the table. This is a result of years and years of neglect with just being reactive and how we win work. So just always waiting for projects to come, 
following RFPs or competitions, never actually going and developing um, new relationships and being inventive with, with business systems. It also comes from a lack of transparency and conversation within the industry about finance and about fees and how people are setting their fees. There's still a lot of kind of closed doors. It's interesting in the US, they're very sensitive. The AIA is very sensitive to kind of any kind of fee discussions because they got sued by the Department of Justice in the 80s, I think it was. So they got, so they got sued for, being a monop- for basically trying to create a monopoly. And so now you have this kind of culture of like, we do not talk about fees in the industry. So it's very useful for us as a kind of independent agency that we, you know, that we can talk about fees. And you know, there is a process for you know, working out your hourly billing rate per employee, sitting down, speculating how many hours are going to be on a, on a budget. And if you've got good data, then you can look at it. And now we're looking at 30% profit on your, on your projects. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, if you've been, if you've been active in, in your positioning in the marketplace, um, then absolutely, then you can, we can, you can start making a lot more, a lot more money. I mean, again, in the, in the US, there's a lot more variance, if you like, as well, in terms of salaries. And, you know, they've, if, I've certainly seen lots of examples of architects who are on, you know, like $150,000. So, which is, you know, that's a great salary in, you know, here or, here or in the US. Um, um, that's not the, that's not the standard by any, by any means, but they, but they exist. And so I'd like to see more of that happening here in the uk and the businesses start to to grow up and become much as an industry become much more rigorous and focused on making profit because it will be able to elevate everybody again i think there was uh, i was watching erin pellegrino i don't think you've had them i think you've spoken uh, you've been on my podcast yeah she, so she's fantastic her and jake are brilliant and i love what they're doing uh, out of architecture and she was talking at a uh, an aia conference perhaps i'm not sure where the clip was taken but it was a great little um, speech that she was giving about profit in architecture and she was equating it to you know in 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 a law firm or lawyers as an industry they are very aggressive about protecting their 30 to 40 to 50 percent profit margins and that's part of their business culture and you know people go into law because they want to make money because it's deemed a sensible um, investment of time and resource because there's a structured path there to becoming qualified as a lawyer. And then there's a predictable outcome of being paid well. And so this is why people from different social and economic backgrounds will invest time to become a lawyer or a doctor because the outcome is predictable. And when we're talking about architecture, the outcome is, predict- is predictably bad at the moment. Which is why you put more diversity in them two professions, lawyer, doctors, and lawyers. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So this is something that we, again, as a as an industry, we need to grow up. Those who are listening to this as who are business owners, then you know, okay, let's be, let's start getting real about my profit. Let's start looking at how I'm selling and marketing, and we need to hold up the mirror of truth and kind of just admit, all right, it's not working. It's not working as well as I'd like it to. You know, I'm 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 justifying mediocrity and justifying um, this kind of low level of, of of pay, and it's no longer acceptable. And in, and employees as well, like you know, th- 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 this is time to start to understand. Okay, what's going on here in the business? How can I also help empower the businesses that I'm working in and make the connection between you know, my own, uh, my own contributions and how the business operates and, and what things can I learn about business that can be, that can help elevate the organization I'm working at, or perhaps I want to go and start my own business. But again, I, I, w- I would, I would also, you know, I do think that one of the things about the architecture industry is that we have a lot of people starting up their own businesses that really shouldn't start their own business. And that starting your own business in architecture is a very, sexy attractive thing cool thing to do and actually I, I think being entrepreneurial is really undervalued and underrated and i often kind of wish or look back in my sort of past career um that if i'd learned a lot of the business skills whilst working in a practice i would have been way more valuable 
Yeah. Way, way more valuable as an employee. And I would have been able to have a lot more kind of say in things and advocate things. I don't think it would have been easy to kind of convince people that, you know, I think there's, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's, there's definitely a kind of um, negotiation process that would need to be involved. But I certainly think it's, a, it, again, these business skills are very, very valuable and we need to grow up as an industry. Last couple of questions, really. Um, if you were our RBA president, what would be your top three things that you would change right now? Are you on the spot there? Yeah, oh, that's a good one. I would start to look at a multitude of ways of becoming an architect. I would start to have, I would have, personally, I would have business and economics as a priority in architectural education and would, would start to like kind of pick apart the educational process and have a multitude of ways of becoming an architect and start to make a distinction between architectural thinking and architectural design and then what it takes to become a practicing architect who's going to be delivering buildings. And the core, and I know that Alan Jones did a very good job of kind of starting to outline the the core competencies of of an architect. And I feel like the the business aspect of that is the one thing that I would I would focus on massively. I would like to see the ability for architects to become qualified much much quicker. No need for it to be this long drawn out ten year process. It's absolutely it's stupid. Then the part two was very repetitive and. No, I don't even, I mean, I, I could foresee an education where you don't even need to go to university. More like and, an apprenticeship. Yeah, more like, more like an apprenticeship. And then also, to, to, in, if that was the case as well, then that, that to start to empower businesses of how they could become more centers of learning and how that like kind of educational design can be, you know, more, more in-house. All of that, again, is going to come from um, more profitable, more well-funded, better businesses. Um, and I would make a campaign for wealth creation being possible as through architecture and start to have like development and uh, investment strategies being taught at university, that being part of, you know, the kind of RBA remit of responsibilities, if you like, or, or promotion would start some sort of campaign that was you know, kind of encouraging architects to become financially fluent and also start a campaign with, with potential, you know, developers and client of clients of architects that demonstrates the architect's strategic ability to deal with business agendas and, and kind of use the RBA as, RBA as a platform to help encourage um, better quality cap clients and fees. Definitely like a fee, like a fee campaign. And, and and just have like industry wide look. These these are the standards that we're that we're doing. Be very honest about the benchmarking. That you know we're not happy with these benchmarks. These are where we want architecture practices to 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 be at. And I would facilitate that. And obviously, if I was president of the RBA, then I would hire a business of architecture to and consult with loads of practices. And why not? Why absolutely? Why not? And um, I, <laughs> I think my, I think you would get a lot of people. Um, vaulting for anyone who came up with that and I don't see it I haven't seen it for many many years I mean Alan yeah was probably the closest in the last kind of uh, 10 years mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely spot on there can you please share with me an example of where the business of architecture has transformed a practice if you can at all possible and I obviously this is confidential but there must be something you can share with us Oh yeah, absolutely. We've, I mean, so if you go if you go onto the, the Business of Architecture podcast, there is I'd probably about twenty different interviews that Enoch and myself have done with our own clients, where we've outlined their very specific stories of how they've transformed their their businesses through kind of becoming you know business educated and how that, that's helped them negotiate higher fees and how that higher fees has helped them produce better caliber design work and how they feel more empowered as an architect. Here in the UK, Chris and Kathy Hunt, niche, niche design architects, they're up in Yorkshire. Um, they've been working with us for, for the, you know, about a year and a half now or so. Really great practice. And, and, and Kathy wrote a wonderful article in Building Design recently that was kind of outlining how becoming a better business person had empowered her as an architect 
and kind of gave her more freedom, more creative freedom, more freedom to take on and pursue the sorts of projects that they wanted to pursue, give them a kind of structure for a career plan. And you can see, you can see in their, in their numbers and their, in their business, like how their pipeline has begun to, to grow, how they've, you know, they've been very diligent in restructuring how they do proposals and implementing like a tiered pricing system that helps them close more projects. They've kind of reorientated their time, so they're spending at least 25% of every week you know, marketing and selling. And all of that is laying a foundation for m way more freedom and where they want to go and you know, how they want the business to be supporting their lifestyle. And again, it kind of reflects back onto their, you know, they've got now more choice to how they want to be creatively. In, in the US, um, someone who springs to mind, because I was, I was there recently, and is a, a client of mine called Marina Rubina. And she's in, based in Princeton. And she is just an absolute powerhouse of architectural and business combination, if you like, a, a, a great union. And she's very, very committed to gentle density and kind of affordable housing and good quality housing to be made available out of, in her own words, out of her own kind of frustration of developers not kind of taking more risks. She took a risk and started doing her own development projects. Um, and in order to be able to do her own development projects, again, her sort of finances and business needed to be in a, in a place where it was, where she was able to kind of take those kinds of, of risks. But she, she started on the path of, doing her own her own developments started with a a kind of um, a small a small lot in Princeton very challenging site and she was deliberately looking for a site that had that was going to be legally contentious because she felt that there was a, a lawsuit that, that they'd be able to pursue because Princeton or the municipality of Princeton wasn't upholding their end of the bargain in terms of what was a, what was allowed to be permitted and so this was a kind of thing that lots of developers were like no we're not going to we don't want to get involved with that and she very courageously did it. She ended up in a legal battle and sued the municipality and won, basically, um, and ended up rewriting the, the zoning laws um, so that these potential plots that were all around the city could be unlocked and start providing valuable housing. And she's on a mission for, to transform you know, her local, local area. Um, she, puts, she puts her own money at risk. She negotiates um, deals with developers where, for example, she might negotiate a base level of fee for, for a development project, uh, and then she'll negotiate a kind of bonus for every unit she gets approved on a particular site. Um, and you know, that kind of deal structuring enables her to create a higher level of value and a higher level of fee than she would be if she was just charging it at a, at a regular rate. She's a really good example of um, someone who's purpose driven and using profit and the business to kind of, you know, have good quality housing built. And, you know, she works with, she works with uh, developer clients as an advisor. She keeps a very lean kind of business model. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of success of doing her own project opened a lot of um, opportunities to be working with developers who are now willing to take more of a risk with a, a kind of unknown entity, if you like. And, you know, she's positioned herself as a, an advisor or a consultant with these practices, with these development companies that have got their own in-house architecture teams. And it's, it's very impressive, very, very impressive. So we've got a whole load of wonderful kind of stories. I mean, you know, it makes me endlessly happy when we work with a business that's been leaking money and then we stop the leak and then the leak turns into profit and then all the freedom that emerges from how now having a profitable business and you know people being able to take long vacations with their with their children and participate in in more of the kind of design work that they've been wanting to do because now they've got more money people being able to hire and pay their team properly and very proudly you know be paying well above what the what the market rate is. Um, so it's, it is, it's that the whole economic empowerment and focusing on, on profit and money is, is, is miles and worlds apart from this idea of the greedy capitalist. There's an incredible amount of economic empowerment that really can benefit 
people to be able to do what you want to do and make the impact that you want to make. Fantastic. And I will definitely check out them, um, them episodes and I encourage other people to do so. Are you still doing any sort of practice in architecture? Are you, are you doing any sort of project? No, not me personally. The last project I did was a private house in Aruba and uh, a little, uh, it was a refurbishment of an oast house in Kent. And I got to a, a point with both of those projects where the consulting work that I was doing was definitely like me personally, that was my calling. And you know, there was no, I didn't have any questions about that. And I had to make, the, I'd, I'd, I'd always thought, oh, I, I kind of want to have the architect practice running as well. Um, but it was, you know, half my income was from architecture, half my income was from consulting. And it was just, it was just kind of the, the business of architecture opportunities was the too, too unique class up. So I had to make a choice and kind of go full in with one of them. You know, it was very quickly I replaced my architectural income with consulting income and I'm much happier as a result of it. Maybe in the future, I would like, I, well, I don't have any desires to get back into doing any design work. Though I love working with architects. I absolutely adore working with architects. And I, in the future, I mean, I have started a development company. Um, and this is something that in over the next few years, uh, will become more and more kind of serious about, um, and would love to be working as an architect, not as an architect, but with architects and only being involved in the kind of front end or, or, or just learning to be a good client really and being able to, you know, be involved in contributing to the, to the built environment through working with architects. And I would, I would like that kind of involvement with design for my, for my own personal practice, but for me, um, being involved or delivering delivering projects is it's not something I miss or care to do anymore, unless it's for my unless it's something where I'll be making back end profits on it. I've got two two more questions to go. And you you've been talking today about uh, making profits and you know having a business head and being um, having the right mindset. But what is your experience with financial hardship today in your career? When I first started my, well, this, this whole journey came as a result of being broke. When I was uh, working at Rogers, I was probably getting paid just shy of 30 grand, maybe 28 grand, something like that. And I was always contracting as well, sort of post 2008, stuff was never stable. Um, at the time, it was frustrating and never really felt stable. And, you know, job, job could have stopped at any point and it did at, at times and, you know, had to muck around. But that, actually on reflection now, I was really grateful for that, those kind of conditions because it was one of the things that kind of prompted me to set up my own, my own business. And the, my first year of running my own business, I kind of, you know, my contract didn't get renewed when I was at RSHP after about, uh, I was probably there about three and a bit years, forced me into, I'd already started my own business and in my mind I didn't really want to do an architecture practice I had this kind of you know this nebulous creative practice that was going to do I don't know stage design and graphics and whatever sort of idealized idea I had and I was also a kind of uh, a musician as well where I, and I was in a band and I was very I was I'd set to myself if if the music can make any kind of money for me to live off it that's it I'm out of architecture the music kind of came to a natural completion and I set up my own my own architecture business and the first the first year was pretty rough and I seem to remember the first year or the second year I don't it wasn't much more than 10 grand or 11 grand and it was just the most brutal experience my relationship went to I had to, you know, I got myself into, into debt and had to borrow bits of money and take loans out and all this. And it was just, it, I, I, I was so upset by the whole experience. I've just, you know, you spent all that time at university, which was very difficult, graduated into a career that I, that I didn't feel like I fit in and wasn't happy in it. And there was no people, you know, I like talking to people and I'm suddenly in this kind of, 
profession where you're spending eight hours a day in front of a pad, you know, drawing and didn't really understand how my drawings related to something bigger. And it was just like, I can't, this can't be it. And then I think at the beginning, 25 grand seemed like a lot of money when you're a student. And then you suddenly realize how quickly it dissipates in London. Uh, and you're like, oh my God. And you kind of look, it, it, and also I remember my brother worked in, works in finance. And I remember having a conversation with him and I told him how much I'd earned in the first year. I, was, I mean, it was like, you know, this sort of 10 grand or whatever. And he just looked at me and he was like, are you serious? That's like a monthly wage for, for us lot. That's, that's insane. And, and then he, and he was telling me about how much, you know, university graduates would get paid in at UBS, for example, and they'd be walking into a 45, 50,000 and above salary at the age of 21. And I was just like, what the, like, they're no smarter than, than us. Yeah. Like what decision have, why did nobody tell me this? Why was I like, how, like, and it was kind of like a, a guilt, a shame, uh, a sort of frustration, anger, resentment at the world. And then kind of like, how could I have been so stupid? How did I go for 10 years and not, and not like be aware of this? Even though there were tutors and people who, who would tell you, you know, they kind of, they kind of try and make you brace the, the discomfort of it by saying, you're never going to earn any money, much money as an architect. You don't do this for the, you don't do this for the, um, for the money. You do it for the love. But that mentality doesn't hold up. Yeah. Like I don't care. I don't. I don't care. You don't. You don't put your lifestyle and your well-being at risk to do some to, to for a, for a hobby. Basically, I don't. I don't. It's just. It's not. It's not sustainable. It's really unhealthy cult-like mentality to be sacrificing your life and relationships for for the greater good of of architecture what a load of nonsense and also you, you don't produce better architecture as a result of it but this but this whole experience kind of really rocked me to my core um and you know and i and, and, and i was looking for a way out of the industry uh and i was very fortunate to meet a business mentor who i ended up hiring and i remember at the time i you know his fees were just they were mind bendingly expensive. I just couldn't fathom them. I just, but I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to learn. And he set me a little, he said, okay, look, if you can get together, I think at the time it was like five grand. If you can get to five, if you can bring five grand, I'll do a few months work with you. And I was like five grand and I was earning 10. <laughs> I start, and I, but I was, I was like, I'm going to figure this out. And he gave me six months. And I just went into, I mean, that was the first experience I had of having like a financial focus and a target. And I was like, okay, well, if I win this, 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 and this project, and if I go and speak to this, this, and this person, and I can do that. And very quickly, I raised the finance. Yeah. And then I spent it all on this business consultant. But re relatively quickly, I started to make a turnaround in my, in my own business. He just opened my mind up. And I ended up working, my, you know, I still... In communication and work with him um, today and sometimes we you know he works with some of our clients at business of architecture but it was just revolutionary and then I ended up working with him for a year and raised more money to be able to to do that but those kind of financial goals really gave me an incentive and also he helped me identify skill sets that I was good at and talking and communicating with people and and he was like you know this being with people and communicating, that's a very good business skill. One of the best business skills you can have. And I was like, really? I thought it was just, that was party time. And it wasn't, it wasn't valuable skills. And it was something in, in, in architecture, sometimes, you know, you're kind of criticized for being the one, oh, he's just a good talker. And it's, it's not, you know, anyway, and, and that was very good, just of having somebody like an independent outside eye help me evaluate where my career strengths were, what was, what was good. Um, and he taught me how to negotiate like face to face selling, spent months and months and months like training and then hundreds, if not thousands of different phone calls and things like that, learning face to face negotiations. When I learned negotiation and sales, then my brain just went, oh, so yeah. much is possible here. 
Wow. Okay. That's, that's extraordinary. I'd, I'd had like a previous sales experience being a, a chugger, if you like, on the, on the streets um, and had, had, a, had a kind of naturally gravitated towards that, but always, always felt like it was, a, it was a kind of shameful thing to be doing. But again, kind of realizing actually that, that being able to be with people and, and lead people and again, I, at the same time, I, I did like seven years worth of leadership training uh, and personal development and, you know, learned how to manage people and to be with people. Again, I wasn't intending on being a consultant. This was all for my own benefit. And it came to a point where the podcast really started taking up. And, you know, and again, the podcast started as a result of me wanting to know how are architects making money in their business? Let's start talking about finance let tell me what what are, you, what are you doing how are you negotiating how are you selling how are you marketing and so that whole process was really insightful so i'm very grateful for the experience of being broke because it was very humbling and it was at that time as well was what i needed to kind of just relinquish a lot of entitlement and and to to grow up um and so there was a lot of you know it was very painful and it Created a lot of disruption in my personal life, and there was a lot of shame um, involved in it. But when I reflect back on it now. My business mentor told me this. He said, "He said you will look back on these times with a great fondness because it really shaped you." Yeah. And so, and so, anybody you know who's going through that kind of financial difficulty time, that there is like a silver lining out of it because it can really, you know, it can wake you up, and and take responsibility for your own financial future um because the RBA is not going to save us the ARB is not going to save us the university is not going to save us we've uh, we're kind of here to to take a level of responsibility for our for ourselves and we've got to put our own oxygen mask on first so once we do that then we're able to help other people much more effectively absolutely and the brock architect podcast is trying to help people that is the purpose like your like your your podcast and your business mm-hmm. my, my my final question now to you is work-life balance always being discussed so my question to you is how do you de-stress golf golf <laughs> so i started playing i started playing golf uh, i started playing golf because actually because i wanted to use it as a way of networking probably not the sort of thing that i would normally participate in but started learning that and now i play maybe once twice a week and i play with my dad and it's just a great way just to be outside have a chat you know it's a really lovely way to socialize with people and so i do that to de-stress i meditate a lot so i mean i don't drink alcohol and don't do any sort of intoxicants or anything like that and that was something that happened probably about 10, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I was beginning my sort of business journey that made a decision to sort of relinquish those sorts of substance, substances because they weren't helping me get to where I wanted to go to. And they were kind of inhibiting a lot of, you know, awareness, if you like, self-awareness. And so a kind of meditation practice, I'm a trustee of a monastery up in Northumberland and a, a Buddhist monastery. And I like to go and visit them and spend a week just in silence and having that kind of practice in my, in my, in my daily activities. Um, and I find that really helpful just to, to, to de-stress and to, to unplug. And of course I like to, I like to socialize. I've got my guitar just sitting over there. That's the other thing I like to do in between meetings is play a bit of, play a bit of music. So I like to kind of nurture myself like that. And, you know, obviously, um, health and fitness is, is really important um and certainly when i'm not traveling so much i'm a lot more well behaved with that but i i i I do the the work-life balance is is really important and you know one thing at business of architecture is that we have a, a, a kind of a set of areas or domains in life that you must look after called the core four there's your body there's your being there's balance which is kind of intimate relationships with family and spouse then there's your business and that when one of these becomes out of whack then yeah. it doesn't help and we we're interested in becoming better human beings and as you become a better human being then you can become a better business person a better business being um, and so much of running a business as well is mental 
There's so much psychology behind it. There's so much the importance of actually becoming self-aware. Fantastic. You know, I just want to thank you for being on the third series of the Brock Architect podcast. But this has been a lot of fun. My absolute privilege and pleasure. So thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate it. And keep keep doing what you're doing because it's well needed and massively important. Yeah, and, and same same to you as well. But yeah, I really enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, I'll let you uh, I'll let you go. Awesome, great stuff. All right, all right, thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Jason. Bye bye. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.